This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Bjorn Andre, Jeff Wilkes, and Paley Glendale. Coming up on DTNS, how augmented reality makes Super Nintendo World come alive, clearing up some misconceptions around Microsoft and OpenAI, and are podcasts dead again? Ah. I knew I shouldn't have had it. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, January 23rd, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Also from Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. And I'm technical producer Anthony Lemos. Oh, my friends, did you hear you can't buy Windows 10 after January 31st? Hurry, get out there, stock up. Buy all your Windows 10. No. <laughs> uh, don't worry, it'll still be supported until 2025. Let's get to the quick hits. Back in October, the Competition Commission of India fined Google $161.9 million for anti-competitive practices on Android. It also mandated changes to the Google Play Store. Now, Google attempted to challenge these in court. However, the Supreme Court of India declined Google's request to block these changes. As a result, India will require the Google Play Store to host third-party app stores as of January 26th. The ruling also prevents Google from requiring manufacturers to pre-install games on Android devices to receive Play Store access and also requires Google to play to allow Play Store access on forked Android versions. Mm. Also out of India today, the country's Ministry of Information and Broadcasting ordered Twitter, YouTube, and other social platforms to block multiple videos showing the first episode of the t- 2002 BBC documentary India, the Modi Question, which covered religious riots in Prime Minister Narendra Modi's home state of Gujarat. Ministry advisor Kanchan Gupta said that you YouTube and Twitter complied with the takedown order. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources told him some more info about what to expect from Apple's mixed reality headset. He has a good track record on this stuff, so it's kind of worth paying attention to. Uh, it would be a standalone device, have an interface similar to an iPhone or an iPad, uh, as well as being able to be used as an external display for a Mac. You'd also be able to use Mac, iPhone, or iPad device keyboards to enter text, kind of like you do with an Apple TV. Uh, supposedly, Apple has talked to Disney, uh, as well as Dolby and some other unnamed partners about bringing some VR content to the platform. It would have eye and hand tracking and support gestures. So you could like squeeze a thumb and forefinger to interact. Uh, A watch like Crown apparently will let you switch between augmented reality and virtual reality. So you can see the world around you or have it blocked out. Uh, It also may render realistic avatars if both FaceTime callers are wearing the reality headset. And the battery pack will be an external piece meant to be put in a pocket and connect to the headset by wire. That's the only part of this that I'm like, that does not sound like Apple to do something like that. Mm-hmm. But all right. Uh, the device may yet, according to German, be revealed this spring and then go on sale in the autumn. Alphabet announced plans to cut 12,000 jobs, and it looks like those will largely put Google's Area 120 incubator on the chopping block, at least part of it. Google plans to graduate three Area 120 projects into Google businesses this year, with Bloomberg sources saying that virtually all of their jobs in the unit would be cut. As part of its job cuts, Microsoft eliminated the entire team for its Mixed Reality Toolkit and its VR workspace project Altspace VR. As a result, Altspace VR will shutter on March 10th. And in other tech layoff news, because we have a lot of it lately, Spotify said it will cut 6% of its workforce, impacting about 600 jobs. CEO Daniel Ek said that the cuts were needed to, in, in, in part, being too ambitious in investing ahead of our revenue growth. Meta expanded its partnership with the NBA and WNBA to offer 52 live games on its Quest headsets, as well as a selection of WNBA, NBA, G League, and NBA 2K League games. Five games will be broadcast in immersive 180-degree monoscopic VR through the Stadium platform. It's Stadium because you spell it with an X. Uh, All games can also be viewed at the dedicated NBA arena if you're in Meta's Horizon Worlds. Part of the expansion will also bring NBA-licensed apparel to the Avatar store. That's virtual apparel for your Avatar. That's coming in the next few weeks. In other Meta news, uh, CEO Mark Zuckerberg said Messenger users will start being notified that conversations can be upgraded to -to end-to-end encryption over the next few months. Encrypted chats will include link previews, custom emoji, and themes. 
The Wall Street Journal reports that Wells Fargo, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, and four other banks began working on a new digital wallet that will let shoppers pay at online checkouts with linked credit and debit cards. The wallet would be managed by Zelle, operator Early Warning Services, and operate separately from Zelle. Sources say the banks see this as a PayPal and Apple wallet competitor, letting them keep control of customer relationships. Details are still being ironed out, but it seems likely it will involve consumers typing in an email at a check checkout page. Expected to roll out in the second half of this year with banks hoping to enable 150 million debit and credit cards for use when it launches. Wow. Pay with an email. How very PayPal circa 2002. Um, Yeah. All right. Looking forward to it. All right, let's talk a little bit about Microsoft and OpenAI. A lot of news today about Microsoft investing yet again in OpenAI, and a lot of it slightly off the mark. Uh, repeating some misunderstood nuances of the story. So we thought we'd take a step back and put this all in context for everybody. Uh, Microsoft first invested in OpenAI in July 2019. At that time, Microsoft became OpenAI's exclusive cloud provider through Microsoft Azure. Uh, It has been the exclusive cloud provider to OpenAI ever since. This is one half of a misunderstanding over exclusivity. It it gets thrown around. Half of the exclusivity refers to this. Microsoft invested again a second time in OpenAI in 2021. And on Monday, OpenAI announced a third multi-year, multi-billion dollar investment from Microsoft. With this new deal, Azure will power all open AI workloads across APIs, researcher, and products. Uh, And now we will turn, Sarah, to the issue of open AI being a profit or non-profit company, if I've heard both. Yeah, so OpenAI Incorporated is a non-profit company, but it owns OpenAI LP, which is a capped profit company. That means in each round of investment, investors are limited on how much they can recoup on their investment. So, for instance, OpenAI says its first round of funders were limited to getting no more than 100 times their investment in returns. Okay. OpenAI says on its website, quote, we expect this multiple to be lower for future rounds, end quote. There's no official announcement about the latest round, but one proposal detailed by Semaphore had Microsoft getting 49% of the company, other investments, uh, other investors, Coastal Ventures, Infosys, for example, 49% collectively, and then OpenAI retaining just 2%. But it's unclear if that's what ended up happening or not, because nobody has said so. Given that Microsoft is a public company, we'll probably better understand their investment by their next earnings report, because they have to talk about this stuff. Okay, so we said that Azure was the exclusive cloud provider, and that's part of the exclusivity confusion. So let's talk about the other half. Yes, so they are an exclusive cloud provider. Uh, OpenAI co-founder and CEO Sam Altman told TechCrunch last month that the deal with Microsoft is not exclusive. He wasn't talking about the cloud part. He's talking about people being able to make products using OpenAI technology. Here's where I think it gets confusing. Microsoft licenses some of OpenAI's intellectual property, which Microsoft can then sell to partners. That includes a license to GPT-3's underlying code. Other companies can use GPT-3. Microsoft doesn't have an exclusive on that. Microsoft has a license to the underlying code. So OpenAI can sell access to its own API of GPT-3 and other products. What Microsoft got, it seems, is the right to modify the code for GPT-3 and then put it in its own products, basically do whatever it wants with it. It can use the code from GPT-3 to build Microsoft models that OpenAI doesn't have. For example, in 2021, Microsoft launched Azure OpenAI Service, an enterprise level offering that includes GPT-3 and then enterprise stuff like security, compliance, governance, other enterprise features. OpenAI can go build its own software products. It also has a license to the thing it made, I guess, by default. Uh, And it can make its own services, license its technology to other companies. Uh, For instance, mid-January, it started a wait list for ChatGPT Professional. Uh, The Verge reporting on Monday that some users have got their access and uh, reporting that it costs them around $42 a month. So Microsoft can build their own things in a way that nobody else can, but other companies, including OpenAI itself, can use GPT-3 and and other products like ChatGPT and Dolly in other ways. I think you did a great, both of you did did a great job explaining this, because prior to this, I had no idea what was going on. I I still, just based on my limited knowledge, don't really understand what 
open AI is obviously the open must mean open source. I'm, I'm guessing it's just op open source technology. And I, I think in the beginning, uh, myself and it maybe some other stuff that, well, if it's open, it has to be free. So why is Microsoft putting money in this? Why are they benefiting from this? Why are they selling products based on this? Why are they exclusive at all? Uh, but the reality is more nuanced. Uh, it's, it, you know, it, like they are allowed to make money on it, but how much? Because they're a nonprofit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But part of it is they can make a profit to a point. So it it's a, it's still confusing to me. But I, I think you did a way better job of of breaking this down than I uh, than when we started. I, mean, I think what's interesting to me is Microsoft saying, "Okay, well, we you know we we have bought the license to this underlying code, so OpenAI can still be used by all sorts of companies." But we might be able to modify the code based on what we think is the best path forward, which would then change our version of this product. Um, and, you know, based on how well we do that, we can charge people what we think is fair. Yeah, I think a lot of people thought that OpenAI would go the open source route, and it did not. Uh, and I think a lot of people are confused by the weird corporate structure, which I think Mozilla also uses, of a nonprofit company owning a for-profit company. Yeah. Uh, and then it gets extra confusing. It's like, okay, there's two open AIs. There's the nonprofit open AI. That, that one just owns the for-profit uh, open AI. Uh, and, uh, and, and it owns 2% after this, if you believe uh, Semaphore. But then there's also the fact that it's capped profit. No cap. It's capped. Uh, you can only make so much money as an investor, which is a way, I think, for them to try to stay true to the original idea, which was not so much open source as it was making AI in a way that is beneficial for society. Uh, and so it's mm -hmm. about the reason they didn't go open source in those early days is they said, well, we wanted to be better stewards of this. We only want to release things when we think that there are good guidelines on how to use it properly. Uh, and that's, that's why they had, that's why they're, they're dragging their heels on things like GPT-4. They're like, we could release GPT-4. PT4 right now, but we don't think it's ready. We don't think we have the proper guidelines in place. Real, real quick, I'm, I'm guessing this is super similar to Android and Google, I, like uh, in a sense of of control uh, uh, and, and and enhancing it, uh, enhancing it to make it better. No, sorta? no, <laughs> no. Okay. it's not a great analogy. <laughs> just because okay, okay. Android, the open source project, is independent of Google in a way that OpenAI, okay. the for-profit company, is not independent of OpenAI, the non-profit company. You, you corrected me so elegantly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really, I Lamar. Tried. But I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I like That's why we're here. Yeah, we're we're yeah. talking it through. Uh, speaking of talking through things, the rise, the professionalization, the mm -hmm. death, the comeback, and the possible irrelevance of podcasts have been greatly exaggerated over the years. As we do this podcast right now, we understand the irony here. But one thing we know for sure is that being locked at home during a pandemic was great motivation for a lot of people to say, you know what, I should start that podcast I've been thinking about for a while. According to data from Listen Notes, 2020 saw over a 200% increase in new shows compared to 2019. But now that we have data for 2022, we're seeing an interesting trend. Oh boy, do I have some data for you. So data for last year shows that new po podcast creation has fallen off a cliff. No. The number of new podcasts uh, launch dropped 70% in 2022 compared to the year before and down 800,000 shows compared to the high in 2020. Now, first, this might appear to just be a return to slower growth that we saw in the podcast pre-pandemic, but 2022 saw uh, 219,178 new podcasts, down 35% from 2019, but it's not all gloom and doom. 2022 saw 26.1 million new podcast episodes published, up 44% from 2019. So are podcasts dying, Tom, or did a lot of people just realize uh, there could be a lot of work? What's, yeah. what's going on here? <laughs> Not as easy as it looks, people. Um, yeah. yeah, I I, I think, I think 
podcasts are always dying. That's the joke, right? Uh, any of us who've been doing this as long as, as we have, because uh, cause Sarah and I have both been doing it for more than 10 years, uh, going back to like 2004, 2005, uh, knows that podcasts have been declared dead many, many times, uh, and they're never dead. And I don't think they're dead this time. I think what might be different about this time around is that uh, you did finally maybe reach the saturation point where new shows could no longer find an audience, where it was just really hard to to make a new audience happen. And you had a larger percentage of shows being started by businesses versus uh, someone who's doing it personally. Uh, so a lot of shows, like my longest running show, East Meets West, that I, I do with Roger, w is just something we enjoy doing. Um, but most shows started during the pandemic were probably from Spotify or some other company wanting to make money. And they realized, oh, it's, it's hard to get discovered because there's so many out there. So I, I think we hit that limit. Uh, what is interesting to me is that the number of episodes seems to have outperformed the number of shows, e if you compare it to pre-pandemic, which says to me that it's that the shows that are lasting have found an audience and that audience is sticking around and we're not seeing pod fading from those shows, which I think is really interesting. I mean, so much of this just reminds me of, OK, you know, open up HBO Max. Uh, you know, you've got some hit shows and you got some shows that. I don't know, aren't landing as well as the the network would like. That is very much like podcasts, even though we're not all necessarily part of one single network. I mean, right. f first of all, making a podcast is hard. <laughs> and many people who say, you know, I have a lot of things to say, end up going, huh, there's a lot of background stuff that I did not realize, you know, was, was, was part of the deal. You know, if you can't hire somebody to be your engineer, you got to do it yourself. And that's just not for everybody. Um, it's kind of like when we were talking about the things that people were doing during the pandemic because they had time on their hands. It's like, I don't know. I made a lot of banana bread. Am I going to open up a bakery? <laughs> no. But I mean, why not try? I think there were probably a lot of people who said, you know, let's give this a try. We can't all open bakeries. And yeah, that's sort of, I, you know, it's, it's the same thing with podcast stuff is you, you can have a great idea. You can have, um, you know, a, a heart in the right place. Um, but, but yeah, you, there are so many podcasts out there. I mean, I love podcasts, but I only listen to I don't know, five on a very, very regular basis because, you know, my attention is finite. Yeah, listen, I'm, I am so, I'm, first of all, I'm glad you said that, Sarah. I'm like, I'm so glad people were able to find their creativity and have a voice. I think a lot of people are marginalized, just did not have a voice. Podcasts have been great for that. Uh, however, more people are discovering that there are other places to have your voice, uh, such as, you know, the, the rise of the vertical video, where there's on Reels, Facebook, uh, Instagram, excuse me, uh, Facebook, TikTok, uh, or YouTube Shorts. They're just other av avenues to have your voice. And the barrier of entry, Sarah, is a lot easier on TikTok than it is on uh, making a podcast. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, folks, uh, we thought you'd be interested to this because you're listening to a podcast. Uh, we, of course, have more thoughts on this because we're creators. Uh, so patrons, stick around after the show uh, if you, if you want to hear more on Good Day Internet. And if you have a thought about why you think this is happening with podcasting or questions about Microsoft OpenAI or anything else, email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Super Nintendo World opened at Universal Studios Hollywood, uh, or it will open uh, at Universal Studios Hollywood Friday, February 17th. This is a smaller version of the one already open at Universal Studios Japan. It only has one main attraction, really, one, one big ride, Mario Kart Bowser's Challenge. Future versions of Super Nintendo World are coming to Universal's Epic Universe Park in Orlando, Florida, and Universal Studios Singapore, both expected in 2025. But Lamar and I both were able to attend a technical rehearsal uh, because my wife works for a company owned by NBC, and, and, and NBC, being part of the same company as Universal, uh, was given the employees a, a chance to go try it out. Uh, there, there were a few rough edges because, you know, they're, they're still rehearsing, uh, but Lamar... I thought it would be interesting to folks on this show to hear about the augmented reality that is in the Mario Kart ride itself. Because I'll be honest, I was a little skeptical of how well it worked would work. The, the idea is you, you put on a headset when you're on the ride and you're going to see things through that that you would not see if you didn't have that headset on while you're on a cart that's on a track. 
How did you? How did you find that? So you saw it, 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 and later I found out you knew walking in this was going to be AR. I did not. I thought we were going to get an actual cart. <laughs> and drive around like a go kart, and it wasn't until we got up to the to the door, and I, and and they did a presentation, the pre presentation. I'm like, AR, oh, that just sounds awful. And I gotta say, Tom, honestly, it was anything but. It it, it was. Uh, we later I found out Nintendo made their own AR, but once you put that uh, that over your, you know, like you know you're in on a the, uh, on a theme park ride, but. I really felt like I was hitting people's carts with my shells. I really felt like I was earning those coins that I was I was seeing pop pop up on, on the screen, and it 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 looked and felt really good. Like it felt solid. Uh, I don't really have any complaints on uh, on it. To, to be honest, like, I I think they they nailed the experience. The best. I feel like I don't know what better you could do with a theme park ride. Uh, what do you what do you think? Because uh, maybe VR. Yeah, no, I I, yeah. I, th I thought this was really interesting. Uh, Chief Creative Officer for Universal Creative Terry Coop uh, told Theme Park Insider a while back that that they invented this AR because I was nosing around trying to be like, well, did they mm -hmm. use Hololens? Did they get something from somebody else? Was it right? You know, right. was it Quest? Was it uh, I don't know, ma Magic Leap? What what, what was it? Uh, they said they created their own. I still bet they sourced some parts and technology from somewhere else, but they built it on a game engine, and I would assume that's going to be a Nintendo game engine uh and what i found in reality is that you, you put this thing on you start rolling forward you feel like you're on a theme park ride and the idea mm -hmm. is that you have a controller that is your steering wheel when the arrow comes up in front of you to turn right or left you have to turn right or left if everybody in the car and there's four people in the car turn right at the same time you turn better and it's going to score you more points in the game mm -hmm. uh, you also can press some buttons to shoot turtles and there are things you can look at and as you look at them you see a little dot that's targeting and the 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 turtle shells will you know fly out and hit things and i saw turtle shells hitting things mm -hmm. but it wasn't until halfway through the ride where i realized hey this is actually working like when we all turn, I feel us turn more, you know, it's still on a track, but we are having effect. And I would sometimes stop my turtle shells and realize like, Oh, that stream of turtle shells right there. Stop. That was me. Uh, and I, and so I actually was seeing myself yeah. hit things, uh, and all of that. Uh, it, if it was a real game, it felt like a real game that I was moving through. Yeah, it absolutely did. Uh, it also felt like 90 minutes of standing yeah. to get there <laughs> <laughs> for two minutes a game <laughs> <laughs> for two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. But no, I, I was impressed. I definitely want to do it again. Uh, as, as Eileen, uh, <laughs> told me in a text, uh, single, single writer <laughs> next time. Yeah. So we yeah. get through the, the line single faster. rider line was like 10 minutes. We, we, we were all in a group together, uh, and it took an hour mm -hmm. and a half, but you you know, your mileage yeah. may vary. Obviously this is coming to Orlando at some point in 2025. They're going to get the Yoshi ride as well too. Uh, but I think what's interesting is if, if I do go back and try this again, uh, they're going to have new content because it's got on a game engine. So they can push updates the way they would to a normal video game. Oh. They can also swap out the hardware. So they made the hardware modular. I probably wouldn't notice anything about that anytime soon, but they said as AR and VR technology gets better, they will be able to go in and take out pieces of the ride and put in new technology to keep pace so that you're not saying mm -hmm. like, hey, my, my Quest 2 is better than this. Yeah, another cool piece of technology that's optional uh, for using a park is a $40 uh, wristband that uses NFC technology, uh, similar to the Amiibo that Nintendo make, uh, the little, little characters that you can put on the gamepad uh, to get new coins or extra things in, in the game. So what you would do is you, you wear this type of uh, uh, wristband, and they have little stations around there where you can you know, scan it, Get some get coins, and then you get to take those coins back to your Nintendo uh, device and 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 upload them using you know the Amiibo technology to to use in game. And I, and I thought that was pretty you know fascinating. I would have loved that they gave these out complimentary, but 
they're forty bucks, and I, I, I got, I got. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got all of them, is what. Yeah, 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 yeah. They have, they have one of each, one of, yeah. one of each guy. Yeah. So, no, that a Mario. it is a, the Hollywood version of this is smaller than the one in Japan, and and really, there's the Mario Kart ride. There's one other ride that you walk through and you collect coins. That's AR as well, and then the rest of it is outside collecting coins, uh, hitting the loot boxes and and the the POW boxes, and uh, and there's a there's a game where you can go around and you can you can actually. Uh, you, you can actually collect, you can level up, uh, you can play a little game outside. Uh, it, it is very immersive and it's very pretty and it does make you feel like you're, you're inside of a Nintendo. Yeah. I, yeah. I thought the, like I said, the park was a little smaller than I expected, but I had no time that I feel like, oh man, I waited all this time. Now it, it, there's so many details. We can't even go to it in the show. Maybe we'll talk about it afterwards. Yeah, but yeah. There's so many little details that made this just an immersive experience. And, uh, um, and then again, just the technology that was involved just made it, made it a, a, a excellent experience for, for everybody in, in, you know, who goes to check it out. So go check well, it out. Well, Lamar, speaking of experiences, you are a chess player, correct? I have played chess. Yes. No, I, yes. No, I, I, I also used to coach. I used, I used to coach kids playing chess too. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah, you might already be in. familiar with the story, but if anybody isn't, it's a good one. On January 1st, the site chess.com introduced a new chess playing bot called mittens. You might say who's mittens. Well, mittens has an avatar of kind of a cute little kitten. Uh, you know, looks like mittens. However, Mittens is ruthless. Mittens was designed to not just be world-class opponents, but also use grueling tax tactics to do so. Utilizing painstaking positional battles, Mittens is ruthless. It also makes kind of weird things by referencing ominous quotes from the likes of Robert Oppenheimer and Friedrich Nietzsche. Playing against Mittens has become a phenomenon for the site, though, because Mittens is so hard to beat. On track to serve more than 850 million games in January alone, that's 40% more than any month in Chess.com's history. So listen, <laughs> they, uh, they have other cats <laughs> with different uh, chess ratings. They have Angry Cat, Scaredy Cat, then they have a Grumpy Cat. So they all have different personalities, and they they, they have lower lower ratings. They, they get you in, get you in the door. Oh, I'm beating all these cats, no problem. This is my I usually do this to warm up on Chess.com, and then I saw Mittens with the one rating, like one that that has to be an error. So I'm like, well, I beat all these other cats. I'll you know, no, no, can't beat Mittens. Mittens not only beat me but trash talked me, like just talk <laughs> mess. The whole time, and I'm just like, what's going on? What what happened? I, we were just having a good time on chess. I mean, and, to be yeah. fair, that is very cat-like of Mitten. It's very cat-like. Yeah, they're just devious. But I love cats, so uh, I will be. I still will be going back. But Mids mesmerizes you. See, because you you're like, no, 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 no. I need you got to go back and try again, try again. But it's it's been beating like world, you know, phenomenal chess, uh, phenomenal chess players. And they're just stumped at this engine. So I'm, I've had fun with it, and I hope others try it out too. I, I know that the the uh, the model, the the learning model behind this is really good, but also that gambit luring you in with a cute cat picture to distract you. Oh yeah, yeah it's genius. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thanks to you, Lamar Wilson, not only for playing chess but also for being with us here today. <laughs> uh, let folks know where they can keep up with your latest. I, yeah, if you, I, I just put a video today on uh, over on the internet, but specifically on, on YouTube, if you want to watch it there, that uh, documents in about fifty seconds uh, our our trip yesterday at the uh, Nintendo World. So, uh, and and Tom is then in the video uh, very very quickly, Ooh. but but uh, I'm again, Tom, very grateful to you and uh, Ali for letting me go there and, and be able to document that experience to put on my channel. So, if you'd like to see my videos on any kind of lifestyle technology. Uh, pop culture stuff, uh, check me out. Uh, I'm LamarWilson.com. Uh, you can check me out anywhere uh, that you feel comfortable. So thank you. We also have some brand new bosses we got over the weekend. We've got Stanford. We've got Tina. We've got James. And we've got Quaid. They all just started backing us on Patreon. So a big thank you to you, Stanford, Tina, James, and Quaid. Good to have you with us. Indeed. Good, good, yeah. good crew. Ah, welcome. And uh, come on in. I know. Have a seat. Is, this is very hard for me. Yeah. Let's, let's yeah. know what you're Let's thinking. play chess. <laughs> Speaking of patrons, do stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We have a lot of fun on that. We will talk about 
all the things. You can also uh, check out DTNS. We are live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. If you want to join us live, we'd love to have you. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow talking chat GPT in resumes and cover letters with Megan Maroney joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>